The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Um, I hope you're all recovered from the quiz. Um, our, our apologies for, uh, for hard questions, uh, but uh, uh, you know, it's just the first quiz. Uh, we have a lot more fun things to do in 006. Um, so today's lecture, today's lecture is, is, uh, is a light lecture. I, I would even call it a recreational mathematics lecture. And so thanks for coming. I'll, I'll make it worth your while, all right? So we're going to talk about irrationals. Um, the motivation behind this is really that every once in a while, we're going to uh, have a situation where we want to compute with numbers that are much longer than 64 bits, which is really the word length in a standard computer these days. You know, it used to be eight bits uh, you know, back in the day. Uh, for um, uh, you know, most of uh, my adult life, it was 32 bits. And recently, uh, Intel and AMD have gone to 64-bit processors. But 64 bits um, ain't near enough. Um, if you want to do uh, what's called high-precision computation, you, know, you want to find uh, uh, precisely the weight of a neutrino, if you're a physicist, for example. And uh, you know, that you're talking about uh, 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 literally uh, 100 decimal digits, which is uh, obviously much more than 64 bits. And uh, that's just one example. So what happens if you want to compute uh, the square root of 2 uh, to a million digits, or pi you know, to uh, 10 million digits? How do you do that on a computer? Uh, so that's uh, what we're going to do for this module, which is a short module on numerics. Uh, we'll have a lecture today and, and another one on, on Tuesday uh, 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 telling you about techniques that uh, use, among other things, Newton's method uh, to compute uh, irrational numbers, uh, as one example, to arbitrary precision. And uh, for your problem set, uh, you're, you're going to uh, look at a different application that corresponds to uh, encryption, uh, RSA encryption, where you have to work with uh, primes. These are now integers, but you work with primes that are uh, thousands of bits long. Right? So again, much more than 64 bits, and so you have to Think about how you're going to multiply numbers that are thousands of bits long, how you're going to divide numbers that are thousands of bits long, and that's really the purpose of this module. All right? So let's start off by talking about irrationals. And Pythagoras, whom I'm sure you've all heard of, is credited with the discovery that uh, a square's diagonal and its side are incommensurable. So you can't really express the ratio as um, a, a, a rational number, as a, as a ratio of integers. Right? Now, it turns out that the Babylonians and the Indians knew this way before Pythagoras. But uh, you know, he gets credit for the Pythagoras theorem. And uh, he was also a Greek philosopher. Uh, in fact, maybe he was first a philosopher and then a mathematician. And uh, he, had, he espoused a philosophy that I guess is called uh, Pythagorean mysticism that said that all is number. Okay? So the world is, is about numbers. And uh, it, he worshipped numbers. His uh, followers worshipped numbers. And uh, the problem here was that uh, he didn't really like the square root of 2 uh, because he couldn't express it as, uh, as a number, or what he thought of as a number, which was uh, you know, 1, 2, 3, et cetera, the, the integers, whole numbers. So he called this ratio uh, speechless, now, something that he really couldn't explain. Okay? Um, and irrationals were actually considered a threat to the mystics. Uh, because they couldn't really explain you know, what square root of 2 was. You know, they'd, they'd try and measure it, and you know, they wouldn't come up with the, the right answer, because the next time around, you know, it, would, it would be a little bit different if they think, did things a little more precisely or, or not so precisely. And it bothered them no end. 
And so they tried to find patterns in irrationals um, because they considered them a threat. And uh, I, you know, they obviously I, I didn't find patterns. Uh, but you know, imagine if we could actually find patterns, right? I mean, that would be a really big deal, right? Uh, I mean, it'd be better than p equals np, if, if you know what I mean. Uh, if you don't, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, so that's another motivation for uh, high precision arithmetic. Uh, you know, let's try and find uh, uh, patterns and irrationals. If you go to millions and trillions of digits, maybe it's just a matter of time before we, we discover uh, that uh, you know, there's no such thing as irrational numbers. OK, who knows? Right? So let's, let's do that for the rest of this lecture. Let's try and figure out how we're going to compute uh, irrational numbers or things like square root of 2 to arbitrary precision so we can go play around and you know, we'll give you some code and you can play with it. So if you look at square root of 2, I'll just put this up here. So it's 1.414, and you probably all knew that. Uh, then it's 213, 562, you know, 373, 095, 048, um, et cetera. And I mean, I don't see a pattern there. I mean, I see a, I see a zero, you know, a couple of zeros here. It's kind of hard to imagine. You'd probably want to think of a computer a program that generates square root of 2, and then maybe a, a different computer program that's looking for, uh, looking for patterns, right? Uh, so let's, let's uh, not worry about the square root of 2. I want to digress a little bit. I did say this was a bit of a recreational mathematics lecture. And uh, let's talk about something completely different, uh, which are uh, Catalan numbers. So these are really my favorite numbers in the world. And you know, people like primes. Some people like irrationals. I like Catalan numbers. OK, Catalan numbers are, they show up all over the place. And uh, how many of you know what Catalan numbers are? Oh, good. Excellent. So um, Catalan numbers have a, a recursive definition. You can uh, think of them as representing the cardinality of the set P of balanced parentheses strings. And we're going to recursively define these strings as follows. We're going to have lambda belonging to P, where lambda is the empty string. And that's rule one. Rule two is if alpha and beta belong to P, then I'm going to put a paren, open paren on alpha, close paren, and then beta, and that belongs to P. OK? So you, re you iteratively or recursively apply this rule over and over, and you start getting uh, strings that are balanced. Right, so this is balanced. Now that's not balanced. Uh, this is not balanced, and so on and so forth. Obviously, things get more complicated in terms of the parentheses um, when you have more brackets or parentheses. And so, the nice thing about this definition is that um, you can get every non-empty balanced paren string via rule 2 from a unique alpha beta pair. So as an example, suppose you want to generate the string that looks like this, so that's a little more complicated than the strings we've looked at so far, then you obtain that by having alpha be this simple string, and then you put the brackets around that, and then your beta corresponds to this. 
right? So now alpha and beta were previously generated. Um, so if you apply rule two to the, to the empty string, uh, with alpha being the empty string and beta being the empty string, then uh, you get this thing here. Um, and obviously, you could uh, uh, do uh, get beta by setting alpha to be the empty string and beta to be this string that you just generated, and so on and so forth. Okay, So you just keep going, and the strings get longer and longer. The cardinality of the set gets bigger and bigger. And those are the Catalan numbers. Okay, um, And so uh, this is a non-trivial uh, question, uh, which is I'd like to enumerate the Catalan numbers and compute and get an analytical form for the cardinality of the set. And that's really what the Catalan number is. It's the cardinality of the set. And so Cn is the number of balanced parentheses strings with exactly n pairs of parentheses. And I have C0 equals 1, which is my base case. Right? And that's just setting, it's the empty string. So I'm going to call, I'm going to say that the empty string is a string, and that's just setting up the base case. And now I want an equation for Cn plus 1. And I need to use the fact that I can get Cn plus 1, a particular string that belongs to this, uh, to this set, uh, uh, where I have n plus 1 parentheses, in a unique way from a string I've previously generated that was part of either uh, the, the, the set uh, that had uh, uh, n parentheses, or it was combined using strings uh, that, where alpha was in some set that was maybe generated uh, a, a while back uh, with a small n or, or something that's significantly smaller than n. A and another thing that was uh, generated, a beta, that was generated later or maybe at the same time, et cetera. So can someone tell me uh, uh, what an equation would be for Cn plus 1 based on the CIs that are less than n? So what about C1? Maybe I'll ask, a, what about C1? What's C1? 1. Right? C1 is 1, because all I have is this string. That's the only balanced string. Right? Now I have C0 and C1. What's an equation for C2 in terms of numbers? I want a, I want a number for C2 based on C0 and C1. Someone? Yeah. C0 plus C1? No, not quite right. How many, how many strings do I have? C0 plus C1. Yeah, actually, you're right. <laughs> uh, well, the number is right, but the equation is wrong. <laughs> okay, It's not quite that, right? You get a, yeah. C1 times C1 plus C1? Yeah. I think you want to use the C0. Okay, zero. C0. Zero. <laughs> but that's not quite right either. <laughs> Someone else? Yeah, OK, you. C0 times C1. C2 would be C0 times C1 plus C1 times C0. OK? And uh, if you're setting the alpha. So here's, here's the thing. You set the alpha, and you choose the alpha. Uh, and then you choose the beta, OK? And there's a, there's a couple of different ways that you could choose the alpha. Right? You could choose the alpha from, uh, uh, you could make it a string that's empty, or you could make it this, the one string that you've generated so far, which is you know, the standard uh, simple string, the non-empty, the non-trivial non balanced string. And, so, and you could do that a, a, a couple of different ways with the, with the alpha. And that's why you have two terms over there. All right? So, so the number 
uh, in, in terms of the, all the equations I got, you know, they all came out to be the same. It's two, and that's correct. Okay. Uh, but uh, this is the equation for it. And so now tell me what a general equation is for Cn plus 1 based on what we've learned so far for the C2 equation. Uh, yeah, back to you. Perfect. OK, good. That deserves a cushion. All right. Good. No, that, that, that wasn't me. That was you. <laughs> and put it right there, right? Bread basket. Right. right. Um, so Cn plus 1 uh, equals sigma. So you gave me a summation, k equals 0 through n, ck Cn minus k, where n is greater than or equal to 0. OK? And you, know, you can figure this out. It's not particularly important as to uh, um, exactly you know, why this is true. Uh, you can think about it offline. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, this is a generator, of, obviously. And it's going to give you a nice looking set of numbers. And um, I came in early and, uh, <laughs> and, and wrote uh, the Catalan numbers up on the board, um, you know, going from uh, C0, C1, C2, et cetera, just in case, just in case you ever see these numbers uh, in real life, right? Or when you're writing computer programs or you're driving on the road, the next time you see a license plate 4862, turn around and tell your mom, or dad, hey, that's the Catalan number, right? And maybe she'll be impressed, right? Um, uh, this, of course, you're not going to see on a license plate, but you can always make up a bumper sticker or something, and you could have you know, the C17 as being a bumper sticker on your car, right? I mean, that's the kind of thing I'd do. But uh, oh. anyway, so, so just in case you see these numbers, uh, I, I'm, I'm, we, we might come back to this a little bit later in the, in the class. But yeah. 42 is on that list. Yeah, it has to be. 42 is on every list, right? 42 is the answer to every question, right? I'm glad you guys did put 42 down in the answer to the every quiz question. You know, so it doesn't quite work, you know, all of the time, all right? But most of the time, 42 is a good answer, okay? Most of the time, right? Okay, good. All right. So um, let's uh, let, let's let's get down to business, right? Uh, so we talked about Catalan numbers. Is the digression? Uh, you know, if you see them, you'll recognize them. I think. Uh, let's let's talk about how we could compute. Let's go back to uh, irrationals and 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 talk about how we could compute uh, square root of two and other things to arbitrary precision. So what I want to do is to talk about Newton's method. And Newton's method is, is something you probably learned about um, in middle school, high school. And let's say you have a function y equals f of x, where this is x and that's y, the coordinate axes. And uh, we're going to try and find the, the root of fx equals 0. through successive approximation. And for example, we might have f of x equals x squared minus a. right? And if a is 2, then you're trying to use Newton's method to find the root, and you're going to end up uh, with uh, trying to compute square root of 2, or plus minus square root of 2 in this case. Uh, but you can go for a particular uh, 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 root, and you, you'll try and converge to that. Um, so the way Newton's method works is it tries, ge geometrically speaking, it tr tries to find um, tangents. And a different color chalk would be useful here, but uh, you don't seem to see one. So what would happen is, let's say you're, you're sitting out here. 
and it's a successive approximation method. So this would give you x of i. And now you want to compute x of i plus 1. And what you're going to do is draw a tangent like so and find the intercept onto the x-axis, the x-intercept. And that is going to be your xi plus 1. Okay, And you have to write an equation for that tangent. And this is, I guess, uh, trying to figure out how much of uh, middle school math or high school math that uh, you remember. What is the equation for that tangent? Anybody? The equation for that tangent. What do you do in order to compute that tangent? Give me a name. Derivative, thank you. So what's the equation for that tangent? Y equals? Someone? It's a good thing your middle school, high school teachers aren't here, huh? <laughs> Not you. You already got a cushion. Someone else? Someone else? All right, I'll start giving you some uh, hints here. <laughs> f of xi plus, plus f prime xi. Thank you, thank you. All right, you get a cushion. Uh, I, I'm getting a <laughs> Whatever it takes, you know, uh, here you go. Yeah, that was left-handed, by the way. I'm actually right-handed, as you know. <laughs> right, so, um, so what do we have here? So we have f prime xi. Now, come on, let's do, finish it, finish it. Times, uh, x minus xi. Times x minus xi, thank you. OK, so now I get it. You, you thought this was, this was too simple a question. You guys were uh, insulted by the question. So that's why you didn't tell me what it was. At, at least that's what I'm going to pretend <laughs> to make myself feel better. Uh, but, uh, so y equals f of xi. Um, uh, plus f prime xi, which is the derivative uh, of, uh, of f, uh, evaluated at xi times x minus xi. That's the equation for, for the line. Okay? And that's essentially what uh, we have to do uh, to you know, compute things like square root of 2, which is iteratively apply Newton's method. The only problem is, you know, this is all uh, good in, in theory, that we can, uh, we can do uh, you know, take that equation and turn it into xi plus 1 equals xi minus f of xi divided by f prime of xi. OK? And if you end up uh, doing f of x equals x squared minus a, then you have xi plus 1 equals xi minus xi squared minus a divided by 2xi, which is the derivative of x squared uh, minus a, evaluated at xi. And finally, you get this equation, xi plus a divided by xi divided by 2. OK? So it's fairly straightforward. xi plus 1 equals xi plus a divided by xi divided by 2. And if you look at this, remember that um, you know, a is typically a small number. I mean, it's 2 in this case if you're computing square root of 2. It's, it, it may even be an integer, uh, maybe a fraction. Uh, but you have to do a division here. Okay? And remember that since we want to compute things to millions of digits, uh, potentially, uh, these numbers, the xi numbers, are going to have millions of digits. right? And so if you end up running this Newton method on a equals 2, then if I simulate what happens, without worrying about the implementation, and this is what you'll get. You have x0. You start with x0 equals 1 with a bunch of uh, zeros. Um, x1 equals 1.5 and with a bunch of zeros, etc. Um, and then x2 equals 1.41, 6, 6, 6, etc. That goes on. 
And when, we're not talking about fractions here. We're, we're talking about um, uh, floating point numbers um, though we, we are, are integers with a certain amount of precision. So you have, you've decided that you want to compute this to d digits of precision, where d may be a million. And so you really, here, you would have a representation that's a million digits long, that, you know, where basically everything is 0. And here, everything but 1 is 0, or maybe a couple if you count uh, the 1 here. And here, you have all these 6s here, uh, and so on and so forth. And you keep going, and you get x2 equals 1.4142, you know, 15686. And I want to write one more because I want to point out something that's important. 1.4142, And what's nice about this, if you go compare it with what you have up there, is that you have quadratic convergence using the Newton's method. OK, and what do I mean by that? Well, quadratic convergence is a nice property. It's much better than linear convergence. Linear convergence would mean that you get an extra digit of precision uh, for every iteration. OK, so in this case, actually, a quadratic is better. OK, usually we think of quadratic algorithms and we you know, kind of throw up. Uh, but um, you know, linear algorithms is what we like. Right? But in this case, it's, it's actually a good thing. You have uh, this, ex uh, this quadratic rate of convergence where the number of digits that are correct doubles with every iteration, as you can see. So, uh, so here you have, uh, you, know, you start with uh, roughly, if you rounded this up, you would get you know, five. So you're, you're saying that that's you know, kind of one digit of precision in terms of the decimal. And, and then now you're, you're talking about you know, 4, 1, uh, 4, 1, 4, 2, uh, 4, 1, 4, 2, you know, 1, 3, uh, and 5, 6. So that's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's you know, eight digits of precision here, four here, and so on and so forth. OK? So, so that's nice. That's, that's why the Newton's method is actually used in practice, because the number of digits doubles. This is a precision. So now you don't get uh, too scared about uh, calculating things that are uh, a million, because you kind of go and say, whoa, I mean, that's not so bad. That's only a logarithmic number of iterations, right? Um, it's not like you have to run for a million iterations. You, you go 2, 4, 8, 16, and, and now it, the, that exponential um, helps you. The geometric series helps you. OK? So that's the nice thing about the Newton's method. I uh, haven't quite uh, I told you how we're going to compute the most important thing here uh, with respect to a divided by xi. Right? So this is just you know, additions. You can imagine uh, that if you have long numbers, uh, you'd end up uh, uh, doing uh, addition fairly straightforwardly because you only have to worry about one carry, right? And so you go off and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've uh, added up numbers that are, you know, tens, if not hundreds of digits long. But I'm guessing you haven't manually multiplied numbers that are, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, digits long. Um, and if you have, you know, I'd be impressed, uh, though I won't believe your result. Um, but um, uh, that's something that, you know, is kind of, a painful thing to do, uh, and so that's why we need computers. And you know that's multiplication. And and I, you know, has anybody divided a hundred-digit number by another, you know, fifty-digit number? No, right? So you need computers. Okay. So we got to be able to do that division there, a divided by x i, um, using using computers. And so that's really the purpose of this in the next lecture. If we're only going to do high precision multiplication here, and and try and see what an algorithm would be for high precision multiplication. Because what we're going to do is essentially take the uh, reciprocal of 1 over xi and then multiply that you know, by a. And we need uh, division is going to require multiplication. You don't really see a multiplication there other than a times 1 over xi. And you can say, well, do we really need multiplication? Well, the answer is um, the division algorithm that is used in practice in most division algorithms have multiplication as a subroutine. Okay, so so we're going to have to uh, figure out high precision multiplication first. It's a little bit easier than division, and use it as a subroutine for um, high precision division, which we'll do next time. Okay, so so now we're sort of back in 006 
land, if you will. We have a problem that is high precision multiplication, and we want to find an algorithm for it. And you know, there's the vanilla algorithm that uh, is, is, is going to take certain amounts of time, asymptotically speaking, and then there's better and better algorithms. As you can imagine, uh, uh, multiplication is just such a fundamental operation uh, uh, that people have looked at trying to reduce the complexity of high precision multiplication. So if you have n bits, um, so what's the standard algorithm for multiplication take if you have n bits of precision? n squared, right? But you can do better, OK? And the people are, you know, work on it. You can do fast Fourier transforms. We won't quite do that here. If you take 6046, you'll, you'll probably learn about that. Uh, but we'll do a couple of algorithms that are better than the order n square uh, method. OK, and we'll do one of those today. So. So the way we're going to work with integers, one little point that I need to make before we move ahead here is generally we're going to say, uh, for the purposes of 006, that we know the digits of precision uh, up front. Because if we want d digits of precision, you know, maybe it's 42. You know, maybe it's uh, 125. In the case of your problem set in RSA, we're going to have 1,024-bit you know, numbers, uh, maybe 2048. So we know D beforehand. Right? And so what we want is an integer, which is 10 raised to D times square root of 2 of floor, um, and which is essentially the same as that. 2 times 10 raised to 2d. OK? So we're going to treat these as integers, so we don't want to worry about decimal points and things like that. All of these things are going to be integers. And there's no problem here. We can still use Newton's method. It just works on integers. And let's take a look at how we would apply Newton's method. in standard form. And we won't really get to the part where we're going to go from division to multiplication today, as I said. Uh, we're just going to look at um, uh, how you can multiply two numbers. Uh, so I, I didn't mean to say that we, we're going to look at Newton's method. We're going to look at high precision multiplication. And then eventually, we're going to use that to build Newton's method, which requires the division. So I have two um, n-digit numbers. And you know the radix could be, the base could be, 2, 10, normally, doesn't really matter. Um, 0 less than x, less than y, less, uh, strictly less than r raised to n. Uh, that's uh, standard for the ranges. And what I have here is, um, the way I'm going to do this is you know, use our favorite strategy, which is divide and conquer, uh, because I have n, which is large, need to break things down break it into, into uh, n by 2 uh, digit multiplications. And when finally I break things down and I get down to 64 bits, I just run one instruction on my, on my computer to multiply the 64-bit numbers. And you know, standard machines, uh, you, would get, you would get 128 bits of result back when you multiply 64-bit numbers. Right? So in some sense, you only go down. You don't go down to one bit. You, you go down to 64, and, and your machine does the rest. So what we have here is you set x to be x1, where x1 is the high half, r raised to n over 2 plus x0. So x1 is the more significant half, and x0 is the low half. And the same thing for y, y1, whoops, r raised to n over 2 plus y0. 
And you have, now the ranges change. Um, x0 and x1 are smaller. So that's what you have for x0 and x1. Same thing for y0 and y1. So that's a fairly straightforward uh, decomposition of uh, this multiplication operation. And again, if you do things in a straightforward way, uh, you will create a recursive multiply, as I'll write here. And what you do is you say let z0 equal x0 times y0, z2 equals x2 times y2, and uh, I miss z1, but z1 equals x0 y1 plus x1 y0. And I have overall z equals xy equals x1 y1 times r raised to n plus x0 y1 plus x1 y0 times r raised to n over 2 plus uh, x0 y0. And this part here was z0. Um, this part here was z1. And this part here was z2. And if you look at it, you need four multiplies, right? Uh, one, two, three, four. And you need four multiplies of n by 2 n by 2 digit numbers. And by now, after you've uh, prepared for quiz 2, I will just say that it will take uh, theta n square time, OK? Because your recursive equation is uh, uh, t, uh, n, t n equals 4 t of n over 2, OK, plus uh, the, uh, the linear time that you take uh, for uh, uh, addition. So this is t n equals 4 t of n over 2 plus theta n. OK? And you're assuming that the additions here take linear time. All right? So that's how you get your theta n square algorithm. And uh, we're not happy with that. Uh, we'd like to do better. OK? And so how do you do better? Well, there's, there's many ways of doing better. The simplest way of fairly substantially lowering that complexity is due to a gentleman by the name of uh, Karatsuba. This is one of those things where uh, you know, if you were born early enough, you get your name on an algorithm. Um, and what happens here is using the z's that I have out there, um, you essentially say, look, I know z0 equals x0 and y0. I'm going to go ahead and multiply. z2 equals x2 and y2. Go ahead and do that. And now I'm going to write z1 as x0 plus x1 times y0 plus y1 minus z0 minus z2. So you're actually computing z0 and z2 first, and then using them to compute z1. Okay. So someone tell me why this is interesting, um, and just take it all the way to the complexity of an algorithm. What is, um, explain to me um, why this is interesting and why Karatsuba's algorithm has, I'll give it away, a lower complexity than theta n square, but tell me what it is. Right? Someone? Someone other than you? Someone way at the back. Yep, out there. And raised to. 
log base 2 of 3. That's exactly right. And now, well, why did you get that? Explain to me how you got there. That's right. So first insight is that we're only doing three multiplications here. Additions are easy. And we're doing three multiplications as opposed to four. OK? So, so tell me how that equation changed of Tn. Tn equals 3 times T of n over 2 plus theta n. OK? Because you're doing three multiplications rather than four. Multiplications are the co complicated operation. Divisions are even more complicated. But additions are easy, and you can do those in linear time, OK, for n, n digit numbers. And so if you do that, and then you go off and, and you say, well, that tells us that Tn equals theta of n raised to log 2 of 3, which is, by the way, theta of n raised to 1.58, roughly speaking. And I, I, I do not want to compute that to arbitrary precision, though I could. OK, but that goes on and on. Uh, once you grab this after you're, after you're done. Right, but that just goes on and on. 1.58 is a, is, a, is a rough approximation. OK, that's an irrational number, too. Um, assuming you think that irrational numbers exist, that's an irrational number. OK, so good. Um, that's, that's really all I, I had. Um, it's, by the way, it's 1.58490625. I really should have written that down. 1.58, in the, in the context of this lecture, I think it's important that we get at least a few digits of precision. Okay. Um, now, you can imagine that uh, you could do uh, uh, better than this. And it turns out that uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this next time. Uh, but you can imagine breaking this up into not n over 2 chunks, but n over 3 chunks. Right? You know, why don't I just break up x into, into uh, at the top third, the middle third, and then the bottom third? And then try and see if I can get away with fewer than eight multiplications, right? Because the original thing uh, would, have, would, have, would have taken eight. And if I can do less than eight, maybe I can reduce that, uh, that 1.58 number. OK? So, so that's a little bit of a preview for what, what we'll do next time. But what I'd like to do is um, uh, do, a, do a demo. And I want you to run that. Uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's out there, so blank that out for a second, um, right? Um, what I'd like to do is um, uh, really look at it a, a different problem than square root of 2 and um, show you a, a demo of code that uh, Victor wrote uh, that computes uh, this particular quantity uh, that you, know, you would argue is irrational uh, to um, a, a arbitrary digits, though we'll probably only go up to about 1,000 or so today. And you know, we'll just look at you know, root 2 is kind of boring, right? It's been around for a while. Let's, uh, let's go back and you know, remember high school geometry. OK? So I think your uh, high school teachers would like this lecture. Nice little review. So, so what is that? Uh, well, that's supposed to be a circle, OK, in case you've forgotten. Right? That's supposed to be a circle. OK? Um, and if the circle here is, uh, is a really big circle. OK? It's, it's a trillion units long, all right? I'm into big numbers today, OK? Big numbers, all right? And the center of the circle is C, OK? C for center. That is what's called a radius, in case you've forgotten, OK? And, and that's B. And this is also a radius, OK? And that's, that's A, all right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I want, I'm going to drop um, a little, um, I guess, the perpendicular down, which has one, which is one unit high. So, so the way that uh, this is structured is that you know this is one unit high. This obviously is. Someone tell me what that is. CB. Half a trillion, right? That's half a trillion, um, and of course, obviously CA is half a trillion, right? And if I call this D. Somebody who re remembers um, high school or middle school geometry, give me an equation for AD, and, and that's definitely worth the cushion. Okay. So what's an equation for AD, guys? Yeah, go ahead. Square root of yeah. Minus, minus the square root of half 
Perfect, perfect. OK, good. So AD equals AC minus CD. And that is going to be half a trillion. OK, that's 500 billion. You know, it's a little bit less than bailout money, but you know, it's close. Um, 500,000 minus square root of 500. This, when you start squaring this, of course, now you're in real, real big money. But 500,000 square minus 1. OK, so, so forget the square root of 2. Um, you can put the screen down. Uh, so is it on, the projector? Um, it's on, it's just muted. OK, um, you can turn that on. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to show you uh, the digits of, um, of this uh, crazy quantity being computed uh, to you know, tens of thousands, thousands of digits. And, uh, and you'd argue that this you know, is, is something clearly that isn't a perfect square, right? I mean, you took a perfect square, subtracted one from it, and so you have an irrational quantity that's going to go on and on. And let's see what uh, numbers, uh, uh, you know, what it looks like, right? OK? I hope you can see from the back. <laughs> Looking pretty good so far. Looking pretty good. Okay. Uh, somebody see the numbers somewhere else? <laughs> Have you seen these numbers before? Like, like 20 minutes ago, like right in front of you. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I think that's a good place to stop. All right. Um, if you want an explanation for this, I think you can go to section tomorrow. I'm getting you some uh, some attendance tomorrow. All right. Um, happy to answer questions about uh, about the rest of the lecture. Uh, and uh, thanks for coming. <laughs>